I love the people that use Discord like it's SimCity. They create like hundreds of channels for absolutely no purpose that never get used. They create a bunch of voice channels that no one is ever using. You could just have like two voice chats and two text chats and that would work for 99% of the population. It's like companies that get crazy with Slack and next thing you know your sidebar like scrolls on for six miles. It ain't good. It just ain't right. Just ain't right. All right, so Kerberos is a really big topic. People have been asking me to talk about Kerberos for a while. Most people have heard of Kerberos, they just don't know what it is, and they don't realize that they've probably used it before. I bet a lot of you probably think of Kerberos as like this security thing that you've heard of. You know that it probably has to do with network logon, accessing resources on like an enterprise network. You might know that it was invented by MIT in the 80s to solve the scalability of network logon. You might even know that it's named after a mythological three-headed dog. But most people don't realize that if you've ever logged on to a Windows workstation in a school or an office or an enterprise, government, internet cafe even, you probably use Kerberos. If you've ever logged into a Windows login screen that has this third field called domain, you're using Kerberos, or at the very least Windows is trying to use Kerberos. Kerberos is one of the more successful things that Windows security has going for it right now. I talk about this in my Active Directory video, but Microsoft's implementation of Kerberos and the way that they abstract away the configuration of it, it's so seamless that most people, including you, probably don't even know that you've used it. Or if you did know it was Kerberos, you probably just thought it was some trivial, you know, process. So Kerberos is a network logon protocol. What the fuck does that mean? That sounds bland as fuck. You know what it sounds like? A network logon protocol sounds like you are accessing some resource and the resource authenticates you so it talks to a authority of truth a central authentication server you might call it an idp or an identification provider but you would think that you know like the the resource that's doing the authentication would contact the thing that can authenticate you and say hey is this credential correct is it correct because I have a user knocking on my door trying to access my web server or proxy or file share or whatever the fuck and I need to know are they valid and you might expect the central authority to be like yes or no or no and here's a reason maybe and you might expect that there's cryptography in there to make sure that the credential isn't intercepted by bad actors that might be privy to the packets on the wire and you might also have a nonce in there or some other mechanism to mitigate against a man in the middle or a replay attack and the protocol might allow for the server to send back additional information like the user's name or what groups they're in and if you were talking about ntlm or radius or tacx all these things would be true but we're not we're talking about kerberos and kerberos is like a fucking triangle motherfucker kerberos doesn't go abc kerberos goes a b b a b c b d b d b d b d b d for real it's really cool let's talk about it now to even remotely get into why kerberos is used the way it is and how it's awesome we need to talk about what the actual experience is like what what do you get when you use kerberos what does that give you so let's say you go to work for a company that uses microsoft windows which is a lot of companies uh the story begins when you get hired and they create your account in active directory they're going to create an account and they're going to assign you a username and they're going to create you a password an initial password that you can change or they can change or you know how passwords work so you arrive on day one you log into your windows computer and at that point you're logged into windows and then maybe the first thing that you have to do is open outlook and check your new email or access some files on a file share you're going to open microsoft teams and you're going to join a conference with your uh, orientation advisor uh, let's say you open a file share to access some documents that you have to fill out you access the internet through the company proxy server you have to update your availability on the sharepoint calendar um, and you also have to do some corporate intranet stuff on some corporate intranet websites that are behind the company's corporate single sign-on app. In the typical situation, you wouldn't have had to log into any of those things beyond logging into Windows. It is possible that you work for a company that doesn't have single sign-on, they don't have Kerberos, but the typical case is that these things just automatically know who you are. 
there's some fucking old dude staring at me. Because you're a new hire, there's a couple cases where you don't have access to things yet, and, you know, it just says you're not authorized, and then, like, the guy that's training you, like, gets you added to a group someplace, and then suddenly it works. But you get to the end of your workday, and you realize that, hey, I never had to put my password into anything except Windows. That's kind of crazy. At my last company, I had to put my password in to submit a timesheet, I had to put my password in to open a file share, I had to put my password in if I wanted to access email. This is crazy. It must be insecure. It is not insecure. It is the best case scenario. The fact that you don't have to enter your password into all of these resources not only means that you save the time not entering your password into all these resources, but it also reduces the chance of password theft, someone shoulder surfing, it reduces the chance of you choosing a ridiculously simple password, and it can even reduce the risk of the application. If the application doesn't accept passwords at all, then you can't attack the application with a stolen password. You would have to carry out your attack a different way. It doesn't eliminate your security issues, but it certainly reduces a lot of them. Many of the standard security controls enacted in the enterprise uh, revolve around passwords. Password management, password storage, password handling. How do you bake passwords into a script or a service or something that has to run unattended? Where does that password go when it needs to talk to some backend database? There are solutions out there like CyberArk, which manage your passwords and make it completely seamless to where the users don't even see the password. But there's always going to be a credential under the hood. And that credential is usually the password, uh, or in the Microsoft world, the password hash. All right, I know you're waiting for the analogy, so let's do the analogy. All right, so let's say we have a concert venue. Let's say we're going to have a really popular concert. I don't know, Andy Kaufman's going to return from the dead one night only. We are in charge of ticketing and access for this concert. People are going to be dying to get into this concert. So we need to make sure that people are properly authorized, that we have proper backstage passes, front stage passes, press passes, you know, typical shit you'd have to do at an event that big with security. If you paid the promotion company money, then you are entitled to be in some portion of this venue. Before we let you in, we need to make sure that the seat that you have a ticket that you're gonna sit in is paid for and it was paid for by you. So authentication is identifying who you are and authorization is identifying whether or not you have access to some resource, whether you can or cannot do something. So here there's multiple entitlements. There's the main show, there's the backstage area, there's the after party, and you are going to this concert. And guess what? You're entitled to all of these sections because you are a member of the press. The most stateful solution would be for them to accept the money up front, you know, just like you're walking into like a, a, a small carnival or something. You give the money on the way in and uh, that's it. They know you paid because they wouldn't let you in until you paid. And this works for, you know, small events because there's no setup, there's no infrastructure, there's no state that they need to track. You're either inside and you got past me or you're outside and you didn't get past me. I don't have to track whether I've seen you or before because you're not going to leave. And if you do leave, I'm just going to charge you more money on the way in. But letting tens of thousands of people into the venue like this is not efficient. For one, accepting cash takes like 20 times longer. And now you also have a dependency on a secure truck to get the cash from where it's piling up at the front of the venue to wherever it's going to go. Enter Ticketmaster. Ticketmaster is our solution. So you create an account with Ticketmaster and they handle your identity. And not just for this one promoter, for all the promoters that need to uh, let you into venues. You create your account, you set up your payment method, and then you have a credential that Ticketmaster lets you uh, come back to them. No matter which venue you want to pay for, you just go back to Ticketmaster and they know who you are. That credential that Ticketmaster uses, whether that's your phone number, email, whatever, that doesn't need to be known by the venue you're going to. The person on stage at the concert isn't going to know who you are. They just know the Ticketmaster said that you paid their promoter. So you log in your Ticketmaster session and within your Ticketmaster session, you say, I want to go to this Andy Kaufman uh, is not dead concert. And I need the main show. I need the backstage and I need the after party. And Ticketmaster will be like, yeah, sure. I'll take your money and I'll give you three tickets. One for this entitlement, one for that entitlement, one for this entitlement. And now you have these tickets and these tickets say on them, these tickets are for you. They are 
for you. You are the principal of this ticket. The ticket is not valid for other users. And it also says what it is valid for. It is valid for the backstage. It is valid for the main show. Um, and it also says when this ticket is valid, when it expires. This ticket is for this show one night only, May 20th, 2070, well, who knows? But it, it, it is all within this ticket. For the purposes of this analogy, let's say that these are physical tickets, not e-tickets. All right, there's physical tickets, the good old style printed out with the, maybe with the hologram, with the security features so that you cannot tamper with the ticket. And these security features are secure enough that the venue will honor the ticket merely by looking at it or scanning it during some super cursory check that does not require them to have your account, have an online connection going to Ticketmaster. It is efficient. When patrons arrive at the show, when they go to the venue at the door, they're asked if they have tickets. If they don't, at some venues, they may be able to purchase them on the spot, but it's nowhere near as seamless as if they just had the ticket already through Ticketmaster. So now the venue can process your admittance super easily. The individual ushers admitting people at the main stage, for the backstage, in the after party, they just have to validate the ticket. And the venue knows that the subject has paid for the admittance and that they're allowed into this section of the concert because they don't have to trust you, they just have to trust the security of the ticket you're giving them. As long as they're reasonably sure that this came from Ticketmaster, whatever it says on it is as good as trusting Ticketmaster saying it directly. And additionally, the ticket could also carry metadata, such as the fact that you're a member of the press. All right, so are you ready to unravel the analogy? Unraveling the analogy. In case it wasn't obvious in this analogy, the Ticketmaster process is Kerberos. The old school payment method where you bring cash to the venue, that's like NTLM. NTLM is NT Land Manager. It's the older authentication mechanism that is just merely providing a credential and the server on the other end saying, yeah, this is good or no, this is not good. When you authenticate to computers in a work group, that's using NTLM authentication, not Kerberos. When you go to the venue and they ask if you have a Ticketmaster ticket, and if you don't, they still let you purchase one, like at will call. That's what Microsoft calls negotiate. Basically, the client attempts to use Kerberos if it's available, and if it can't, then it falls back to NTLM. This is why you never really notice that Kerberos fucks up. So when Kerberos fucks up, the most you'll really ever encounter is like a user and password dialog box in a place where you don't normally get one. But like, it's never gonna be like, oh, Kerberos error, Kerberos failed. It'll always fall back to NTLM. And on Windows, by default, uh, your password hash is automatically passed forward. That won't happen on Mac though. So if you're using Mac with Enterprise Connect or Apple SSO and Kerberos does stop working, you will notice because you will get uh, prompted every time where you wouldn't have before. You, in this analogy, or the customer, is the user principal. The user principal is the user that is authenticating. The venue, or more specifically, each area of the venue uh, that requires authorization is the service principal. So your service principal is like your web server, your file server, your SQL server, you know, whatever, whatever resource it is that's going to be authenticating you. And this can even be your own machine, your own computer, like, you know, your computer accepts authentication across the network or even within itself. When you authenticate to Ticketmaster, that is like your initial login into Windows. Or if we're not talking about Windows, that's your, like your K in it. That's where you get your ticket granting ticket. And in this analogy, your session with Ticketmaster with which you're buying concert tickets, that is like your ticket granting ticket that has authenticated you to the key distribution center, which is like Ticketmaster's website slash API. Um, and that in turn allows you to get tickets, literally both concert tickets or service tickets. And when you buy tickets through Ticketmaster, that is like the AS request where you go to the domain controller, AKA the KDC, the key distribution center, and you say, hey, I am showing you my ticket granting ticket and I want you to grant me a ticket so I can go talk to this proxy server, IRC server, whatever it is. Just kidding, IRC doesn't use Kerberos. There was an IRC server that used NTLM though. 
and it was made by Microsoft and it was part of Exchange actually. And then take note that in this analogy there are pre-established trusts. There's a pre-established trust between the venue and Ticketmaster so they already have established some trust like this isn't just ad hoc. Uh, they already are working together and also the customer with Ticketmaster, like when the customer goes to Ticketmaster's website to log in to purchase tickets, they already have some account there. So there's already presumption of trust between the uh, service principal and the key distribution center and the user principal and the key distribution center. And those presuppositions of trust are what we call in the Windows world, accounts. Let's talk protocol details. <laughs> So like I said, the user and the computer that the service is running on have accounts in the directory. Now this part of it is not part of Kerberos. How the accounts are stored, how the passwords are stored, the directory structure, even what protocol the directory uses, in Microsoft's case it's LDAP or LDAP-S, are outside the scope of Kerberos. So real quick, your password doesn't have to be a password. Kerberos works with other types of credentials like a smart card. How the computers find the key distribution servers, in Microsoft's case through SRV records, that's not part of Kerberos. How the clients figure out which server is the closest one to them or the best one to choose uh, is also not Kerberos. The part where the operating system prompts you for a credential, that's also not Kerberos. In Windows, those little tiles that you authenticate to, those are called credential providers and they're managed by a user interface called cred ui and in the past it was done by gina.dll gina32.dll that's not part of kerberos either all right so what is part of kerberos here's kerberos so kerberos begins when two pre-established trusts are created these pre-established trusts manifest as accounts and in windows they're accounts in active directory one for the user that's going to be authenticating typically created like when they get hired by hr or whatever um, and one account for the computer that's going to be providing the service that's going to authenticate the user. Both of these principles now have the ability to decrypt messages sent from the KDC using their shared secret. So in other words, when a user requests a ticket granting ticket from the KDC, the blob that is sent back from the KDC would be decrypted using the user's password hash. This provides some basic guarantee that you must have the user's password or password hash in order to be able to get to that data. So it all begins when the user logs in. You initiate a session. You obtain a ticket granting ticket. So in the case of Windows, you just merely sign on or start a, a process in the context of a user, whatever, you, you log on. Um, outside of Windows, Kinet, Enterprise Connect, Apple SSO, whatever. Um, you get a ticket granting ticket from the key distribution center. You actually go to the KDC and you say, hey, I would like a TGT for this user principal, me. It doesn't ask for a password. It doesn't ask for a credential. It just gives you the ticket granting ticket. And it is encrypted using your account's symmetric key. In the case of Windows, this is your password hash. If you really are the user that you said you were, or if this is going back to the user that you said it's for, that user will really be able to decrypt that ticket because they have their password hash, their shared secret. There used to be an issue in the original Kerberos specification where the KDC would hand out any TGT that you asked for um, with the presumption that if you weren't the right user, you'd be able to you wouldn't be able to decrypt it. But because of powerful computing, it is possible for a user to request a TGT for a different user, get back an encrypted blob, and then brute force it offline and take as long as they need to to figure out which credential would have decrypted that. Because of this, Microsoft changed the protocol and introduced something called pre-authentication, which basically means the user has to send a timestamp encrypted with their credential first, so the KDC knows it's really them before it sends a TGT, regardless of how it's secured. Once they decrypt the ticket granting ticket, they can then use that to make further requests to the KDC. These are called AS requests. These are requesting access to a service. You identify the service via a service principal name which is typically a service name, a forward slash, 
and the host name that the service is being accessed through. This may not necessarily be the host name that the computer is in Active Directory. This could be a load balancer, this could be a virtual host, this could be a CNAME, but the name that the application is going to be connecting to the resource on is part of the service principal name. A web server might register its actual host name and the actual vanity host name of the website. These are also stored in the directory and also outside the scope of Kerberos. So you provide the service principal name to the KDC in your AS request, and if it knows about that service principal name, they have to be registered with the KDC, it knows which computer account owns that SPN, and it will say, okay, well, that's a valid SPN. Uh, it may do some additional checks. Are you allowed to access this? Is there a selective trust that you're not allowed to cross? Are there logon restrictions? Uh, are you restricted to only using certain workstation host names? Is your account locked out? Is your account disabled? Um, these are all checks that are done by the domain controller or the key distribution center. And all of these checks are also outside the scope of Kerberos, but just know that they could occur. There are checks to make sure that you're allowed to access that service. If you are, the key distribution center will provide you with your service ticket. Once again, this is encrypted with your password so that you can decrypt it and grab the service ticket and you can present it to the service. Just like you're walking into the Andy Kaufman concert, you present it to the thing you're trying to authenticate to. So now let's say you try to access that SharePoint we were talking about. You know, you go to HTTPS, blah, 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 blah. The first thing that's gonna happen is the web browser is gonna try to request the page with no authentication. And it's going to get a 401 from the server saying, no, you must authenticate. And here are the supported mechanisms, the supported schemes for you to authenticate with. And typically in here is where you see the word negotiate and your computer then says, oh, okay, so this is Windows authentication. And it's going to say, okay, can I do Kerberos? So in order for Kerberos to work, DNS has to be available. Client side computer must be able to reach the KDC and the client side computer must either have a ticket granting ticket or must on the spot request one and get one, which the operating system will do if it has to. If Kerberos were not available or if authentication with Kerberos failed, then it would fail back to NTLM. I didn't just change my clothes. This is yet another day. So in other words, when Chrome like authenticates to this web server, your service ticket, this opaque blob of numbers is passed forward to the resource. In the case of HTTP, it is sent in the www authenticate header. And then the resource or like the web server sends it to its Kerberos subsystem, which is like either part of the operating system or some library that it's using. And then the resource validates the service ticket and the service ticket, which remember is just an opaque blob of numbers. It is actually encrypted with the services computer account, the service, the resources shared secret. When the user requests the service ticket from the KDC, the KDC looks up what account that service principal name maps to, and the service ticket is actually uh, the user's access token and some other stuff encrypted with the resources shared secret. This is either a computer account or a user account's password hash. Wherever that service principal name is registered to, that's the account that's gonna get used. And so if the resource computer is able to decrypt that service ticket, it knows that it came from the KDC and whatever user account is in that ticket, if it matches, you know, the context and the predicament by which the user is requesting access, it's within the valid time span on the ticket. Um, it's for the correct user. I mean, yeah, it's it, that that's it. It's authenticated. And baked into this access token is all the information that the resource needs in order to process the user's authorization. All right, so the benefits of Kerberos, what are they? Okay, so we already talked about efficiency. Obviously, the uh, guy at the uh, venue doesn't have to constantly check Ticketmaster, handle money, or do any of that. It's just a, a very quick cursory cryptographic check. So it's super efficient. A resource doesn't have to have an online conversation with a source of authority. 
uh, in order to authenticate Kerberos tickets. This also makes it a little bit more resilient because if the key distribution center is down, once a client has a service ticket for the duration of that service ticket, the client doesn't have to re-authenticate even if the client recreates multiple connections to the resource. It can just keep presenting that ticket until it expires. Kerberos inherently provides some level of mutual authentication. If a resource has authenticated you and it was able to decrypt your service ticket and get the data inside, and thus your access token, that also guarantees that the service is trusted by the KDC, or at least the service is in cahoots with the KDC, because the service needs a valid service shared secret, computer account password, in order to decrypt the service ticket that you gave it. You don't otherwise know that the resource you're talking to is the real, like let's say you go to, I don't know, sharepoint.contoso.com, uh, DNS takes you wherever DNS takes you, and you can hand this site a Kerberos ticket for sharepoint.contoso.com, and you don't have to worry about whether that's the real one, a fake one, a man in the middle, a captive portal, because only the real one that really holds that computer account that the SPN HTTP slash sharepoint.contoso.com is registered to, the computer account in AD, in an OU, only that only that account can decrypt that ticket so i mean not to say that you wouldn't also know that because of tls and public key infrastructure maybe that's a future video but all these things happen with kerberos so you just get these things for free you also get a pseudo quasi a uh, random session key that you can use within your application to further encrypt communications. You can piggyback off the Kerberos cryptography to further encrypt your communications beyond just the authentication piece. And one of the absolute amazing benefits of Kerberos is delegation and constrained delegation. So what is delegation? All right, so this scenario is typical. A user authenticates to a web server, the web server then talks to a SQL server. Or a user authenticates to a proxy, the proxy authenticates to a web server. These scenarios are common. All right, let's just say it's you hitting a website that's hitting a database. So in the most typical and worst case scenario, the website uses a static service account for that database, and it has the permissions of the most destructive thing it needs to be able to do. So if the website needs to be able to create and drop tables, then that account can create and drop tables. If that website is Drupal and it wants to set up its entire database, that account might have sysadmin or system operator over the entire database server. If your website needs to write to the file system, it needs all the permissions that any user that uses the website might need. So that's no good. If you're really creative locally, you could perform operations on behalf of a user. This is called impersonation. So in other words, a user authenticates to your website and when you create a file, you create that file as the user in the context of that user. That's something you can do in Windows. But what about when the user makes a connection to the database? What if you actually want the user context to persist all the way through to the database? What if you want to permission the tables in the database or files in a remote server or roles in a remote website based on that original user, not based on some service account of some application pool or something in the middle? You want to know that actual user all the way through. You want full auditing. You want uh, at role-based access, you want to make sure that only these three people and not the other 7,000 people using the website can read the contents of this table. This is where delegation comes in. Delegation allows a resource to delegate your identity from your original authentication. So in other words, you present a service ticket to a Kerberos resource. It now has you authenticated. It can then take that ticket and request a new ticket on behalf of you for a remote resource. All right, let's think of an analogy. Give me a second. It's like when you request a prescription from Walgreens and Walgreens on your behalf requests a refill from your doctor's office. It's almost exactly like that. 
in Walgreens case they're only permitted to do this uh, for the purposes of requesting refills on prescriptions and they can only do it to specific healthcare providers that they have registered in their database. So this would be the equivalent of constrained delegation. Constrained delegation is like, all right, I trust this resource, but only in the context of accessing these services. So this SharePoint is allowed to impersonate the users that hit it, but only when talking to this database or this file server or this proxy server. Get it? Why do we care? Because it means that we're not using a single privileged account to do a bunch of shit with no audit trail. And it means that the user's identity and their access context gets passed to all the services that they're accessing, even though their credential doesn't have to leave their machine. That's awesome, right? I think it's fucking awesome. I think it's fucking great. As someone that has to set this shit up, I don't want to make user accounts for websites with passwords that only the website owner and me know. Like, what the fuck? So that brings us to the end of the video. If you like this video, I need you to like that button. It helps me out. It helps me out. It helps my credit score. I'm trying to buy a house and I really need help. Just click that like button. I promise it helps me out. I want you to comment below if you learned anything from this video that you didn't know before. Tell me the most interesting thing you figured out below. And if any of this helps you out in your professional career, click the thanks button. That not only says thanks to me, but it also forces me to then say thanks back to you because you have to pay me money to click it. I, just, I love you. I love you all. Bye. Kerberos, give me a K. R, B, 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 B,